we're looking at changes in genotypes. Here are the points we are focusing on. So natural selection is responsible for the differences and the survival and the continuation of genotypes and therefore phenotypes over others in gene pools, right? And it changes the allele frequency in a population in a non-random way. And it leads to beneficial changes to the overall population allele frequency. Now, the phenotypes that are better adapted to an environment are favored, and these can be instigated through a variety of selection pressures. So we're talking about things like competition between species for food, um, territory, whatever it is, competition within the species for food, water or territory, all those kinds of things, uh, predator, prey relationships, sexual selection uh, to successfully attract a mate. They're all types of selection pressures that organisms may face. Now, selection pressures work either for or against a certain phenotype and the alleles that create them. Positive selection favours a particular heritable trait which can increase in the frequency in the gene pool. So in this situation, we're looking at, say, that right there. That is the, the trait that is being favoured and therefore selected for. Now, these alleles can even reach a point in time, if, we, if they keep increasing, where you know, all the individuals in that population show that trait and therefore this is a fixed variety, right? This is a fixed gene. Now, a human example of this is the persistence of lactase gene to produce the enzyme to digest dairy, which previously was thought to stop being produced after childhood, but it's now really prevalent amongst many adult populations around the world. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to digest dairy. So it's thought that this actually emerged around the time that dairy farming began in Northern Europe, and that's actually what your uh, sample IA3 is on. Now, negative selection is the opposite of this, right? On the other hand, not selecting for something that we want to see, it actually removes that heritable trait or slowly decreases that frequency in the population. So we're looking at these types of um, phenotypes that you might see. Now, if it's a recessive allele, uh, homozygous recessive individuals will be selected against and it can actually eliminate them from the population completely, while individuals that are heterozygous for the trait have a bit of an, ex uh, yeah, a bit of an advantage because they're displaying the dominant phenotype and are therefore still you know, benefiting from that. Now, if the trait is dominant, that's trying to be removed, eventually the trait will decrease in frequency so far that it's possible only the recessive trait remains. Now, context is super important in this situation because, you know, as the saying goes, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Now, a point mutation in the gene encoding for one of the hemoglobin polypeptides leads to an abnormal recessive allele that creates misshapen hemoglobin, right? We're talking sickle cell anemia here. Now, people who are homozygous recessive for this gene have misshapen red blood cells and therefore a diminished capacity to carry um, oxygen around the blood and carbon dioxide. Now, this abnormal allele would, you know, usually be negatively selected for in our communities. However, in other communities, it's actually selected, for, sorry, it's selected against in our communities, but in other communities, it's selected for, because it turns out that in the heterozygous um, phenotype, sorry, heterozygous genotype in the trait there, they actually have a little bit of protection against malaria. So in equatorial regions where malaria is endemic, this is really important. So if this abnormal allele is actually beneficial to a community that's, say, exposed to malaria, it's therefore positively selected for there, but simultaneously it is negatively selected for in our communities where we don't suffer, um, you know, the, the endemic malaria. Now, since natural selection can't change an individual's phenotype within its lifetime, it's only observable in a population that shows a change of phenotype over time, right, over many generations. For example, the ability to change the frequencies of certain colour phenotypes to blend in, like the peppered moths we've spoken about, um, this is going to happen across multiple generations. Or, you know, it might be the case that something has to slowly change in frequency, like size of beak or any other physical adaptation due to any relevant selection pressures that appear in that environment. Across observable phenotypes for most traits, there is a normal bell curve distribution. So if we look here, we've got height in people, right? A nice normal distribution. Um, you know, but uh, sorry, the substantial portion of the population are going to fit into this kind of intermediate middle section, right? If there's a change in the environmental conditions, be it abiotic or biotic, there can be a change in the distribution of the phenotypes, however. And we can see this in three different ways due to three different modes of selection, stabilizing, directional, and disruptive. And these are the three we're going to focus on. 
Now, stabilizing direction tends to show an advantage to the most common phenotype by selecting against extremes, right? Most offspring tend to look sort of similar to the phenotypes to their parents. And so this occurs in an environment that's really quite stable. It's like a safe way to keep everyone in the population close to the phenotype. It was adapted specifically for that environment. So if any individual sort of diverges too far from the safe adapted phenotype, they risk being unable to be considered biologically fit and it may decrease their chance of surviving and reproducing. So the bell curve just kind of becomes quite skinny. Now, directional selection selects against one of the extremes and for one of the other extremes, okay? And it leads to changes over many generations in one particular direction. Now, this is the type of selection that the peppered moths underwent and one phenotype was favored and kept while the other one was diminished in, in frequency. So while the other, you know, what, one's going up, one's going down. We can see we're selecting against this phenotype but moving the bell curve in that direction. So it skews the allele frequency by increasing one trait and decreasing another with the bell curve moving. All right, disruptive selection favors the extreme phenotypes. It's sort of the opposite to that stabilizing. So the homozygous dominant and the recessive phenotypes may increase in frequency while the co-dominant or incomplete dominant phenotypes, so in the middle, start to disappear. And this type of selection occurs when the environment is really quite unstable and conditions are fluctuating quite frequently. So in the Galapagos, the finches are a really good example of this. When a drought went through the habitat, it killed off a certain plant with medium-sized seeds. And so it favoured the birds that could eat the large seeds and the small seeds, but nothing in the middle there. That phenotype just um, was slowly eliminated from the population. And there are a heap of different examples of these types of selections out there. So... For example, if we're talking stabilizing selection, um, baby weight is a, an example of stabilizing selection. So larger babies have difficulty fitting through the pelvic bones, but smaller babies are at risk of losing body heat, picking up infections and have higher mortality rates. So over time, we as humans have evolved to have a smaller range of weight at birth. Now, many robins uh, lay exactly four eggs in their nest, which is the ideal number to be able to maximize offspring number, but you know, still manage to feed them and care for them and so their babies aren't starving. And Siberian huskies have developed leg muscles, which are so strong that they can pull sleds and do all those things that they were bred to do, but not that they're so muscly and heavy that they actually sink through the snow. So that medium phenotype of moderately muscly legs helps them to find a balance between strength and weight. Now, if we're looking at directional, we can be talking about cane toads. Cane toads in the Northern Territory and Western Australia have evolved this ability to hop in a really uh, straight line, really quickly forward in leaps and bounds as opposed to sort of jumping all over the place rather than that side to side pattern. So it means they can cover up to six times more ground than those found, say, in Queensland. And the really faster dispersing toads have survived better um, than, you know, and produce more offspring than their slower counterparts. There's also some suggestion that some types of lizards and amphibians have evolved this longer tail so that they resemble snakes, which in turn can ward off predators. So these are our types of directional selection. And squirrels in North America show disrupted selection in their tail length, either short or long, depending on their needs. So those in habitats where they're on the ground and they have to hide from uh, predators, a shorter tail is more useful. But those that are in trees and they need to balance will have a longer tail. So it's not really common to have a middle sized tail with these kinds of species. So our focus here, remember, is identifying positive and negative selection, but also interpreting data and describing. So there's two cognitive verbs there, the stabilizing directional and disruptive types of selection.